welcome everyone to this webinar. I'm glad to see you're able to be here again tonight. This, we're beginning a lesson four of Mystic Minds. And as always, feel free to enter your questions or your comments in the chat box. And I will send you a copy of the recording after we're finished. So tonight, although I know there are lots of other exciting things you could be watching, I want to thank you for uh, being here. And we're going to learn about another great mystic, a deeply influential German Catholic mystic theologian named Meister Eckhart. He was the most illustrious spiritual instructor of his day. Eckhart was also unjustly condemned as a heretic by the papacy. At the end of an impressive career of writing and teaching, preaching, uh, directing souls, and serving in high-level administration of the Dominican order. Eckhart was virtually forgotten by the church for centuries, but now uh, is there's a growing number of people all over the world who see him as one of the world's finest non-dual mystics. His influence is greater now than any time since the 14th century. I'm going to discuss what um, it means to be a non-dual mystic in just a minute. Let me tell you a little bit about Meister Eckhart. Uh, he was born around the year 1260 in a mountain village called Tambach in Germany's east central region. And when he was 15, he left home to join the Dominican order in a nearby city. Now the Dominicans were the church's primary teachers and orders of the time. They were known as the order of preachers. He was sent to Cologne in the year 1280 for his first studies, which included five years of philosophy followed by three more years of theology. And in addition to his periods of study, during the day, he also would have participated in three hours of chanting the daily office. Those are the prayers of the church that are prayed every day by the monks, plus regular mental prayer and long periods of silence. So this was a great preparation for him. He went from there to teach at the University of Paris, and that's where he earned the title of Meister. Uh, Meister means master. Now, at the time, the University of Paris was the center of all academic learning. And he would have had access to the writings of all of the great spiritual teachers. And apparently, he took advantage of that and read most of them. This began an amazing career and rise to stardom among spiritually minded people and mystics. And by 1322, he was the most famous preacher of the time. Well, like all famous preachers, he had enemies. Um, by that time, his teachings were already suspect by non-mystics who didn't understand them and read them out of context. It seems like when he spoke, he delighted in shocking his audience. Um, into the truth that he was trying to present by outrageous statements and puns and jokes and comic stories. And this would have irritated the official um, 
preachers of the time. He apparently enjoyed too much of the freedom that was seen formerly in Jesus to fit very well into the heavy and sometimes morbid religious atmosphere of the Middle Ages. Now, the Pope of the time, John the 22nd, um, he found his works to be orthodox, but, but Eckhart was summoned to an inquisition before Henry II, who was the archbishop in his area, and he was jealous of Eckhart's popularity and fame. So the Inquisition lasted for a whole year. His accusers charged him of heresy. Eckhart charged them with stupidity. He said that they um, didn't have enough information or competence to be his judge. Well, he died in France in either um, 1327 or 1328. And the following year, the Pope succumbed to political pressure and declared his works heretical. As we look at Eckhart's words, you're going to see that he reflects many of the same concepts that we see in the, or we have seen in the other mystics. Although the mystics may have been centuries and continents apart, they all seem to come to similar conclusions. Now, before I continue with quotes by him, I want to present us with some more definitions. Um, these constitute ways that people understand God. And the three words are theism, pantheism, and panentheism. So the first one, theism, is a belief in the existence of a god or gods, especially belief in one god as creator of the universe, intervening in it and sustaining a personal relationship with his creatures. And there are many different forms of theism. So this is a way of believing that's held by many people that there's a God or a God who is out there someplace separate from us. We're the created ones, the creatures, and God is the creator. Yet through prayer or through rituals, one can convince this God to intervene in human affairs. People can have a personal relationship with this God. And God's intervention may be direct or uh, through natural means. It might be a revelation or sending messengers or even appearing directly to humans in some form. Now, most Christians are theists. The second term was pantheism. Now, in pantheism, that's a doctrine that identifies God with the universe or regards the universe as a manifestation of God. And this worship, um, it admits and tolerates all different gods. Pantheism is the belief that the universe and all the things within nature are God. And pantheism does not uh, celebrate a distinct personal or anthropomorphic God. They accept all the gods into worship because they view God as everything and everyone, and everyone and everything is God. Now, you may have heard of pantheism. Christians find this belief very disturbing as it's about as opposed to theism as one can be, because it leaves out the transcendent view of God. But there is another way of believing, and it's called panentheism. That's P-A-N-E-N-theism. The belief or doctrine 
that God is greater than the universe and includes and interpenetrates it. In simpler terms, uh, God is out there, but God is also near. And this was the theory that was embraced by Meister Eckhart. I do have a chart that um, hopefully I will be able to access that might make this a little bit clearer. Okay, here's our chart. As you can see on the left, the first belief is theism. Theism is dualistic. That means there are two parts to it. God is one thing and the universe is another. They're separate. Although God is able and sometimes willing to relate to the world, you can see they are separated. Pantheism in the center is non-dualistic. That is only one, but it denies the otherness of God in any way. God equals the universe. This is a very abstract view of God, not personal at all. On the right is panentheism. This is also non-dualistic in that it is one. The universe is within God. So in this model, we can relate to divinity in both ways. The divine is both outside of us, other, and transcend, transcends our world. Uh, God is beyond us, beyond our comprehension. Yet at the same time, we are within God and God is within us. If that seems really confusing, uh, here's the saying by St. Paul. In, in him, speaking of God, we live and move and have our being. And we put that with the words of Jesus who said, the kingdom of God is within you. Let me use the um, metaphor of the ocean. In the sample of the ocean, the ocean would be God and you are a drop of water in the ocean. So you are in God, yet you are the ocean too. You and all the other drops make up the ocean. Everything in the ocean is God, including you. So this is a, a good uh, image to use in meditation if you want to think about it. So this is what um, Eckhart embraced, panentheism. So let me move on. Here's a quote from Meister um, Eckhart about God. If I had a God I could understand, I would no longer consider him God. I think that's great. If God was really easy to comprehend, how could God be God? Here's a sample of some of his teachings. I have spoken at times of a light in the soul that is uncreated. Um, I should have underlined that word uncreated. That's important. There's something in your soul that is not created. I'm accustomed to hint at it frequently in my sermons. Thus, I may truthfully say that this light is rather to be identified with God. So he's saying there's a light in our soul that is God. To the extent a person can deny himself and turn away from created things, he will find his unity and blessing in that little spark in the soul which neither space nor time touches. Remember, uh, St. Teresa of Abila spoke of the soul as a crystal castle within each of us, and in the innermost room 
we would find the divine. Eckhart also says this, to get to the core of God at his greatest, one must first get into the core of himself at his least. For no one can know God who has not first known himself. Go to the depth of the soul, the secret place of the Most High, to the roots, to the heights, for all that God can do is focused there. Okay. We're beginning to find some echoes here among the writers. In meditative prayer, the mystic has a specific purpose. He or she is seeking the divine. And as I mentioned at our first meeting, uh, people use meditation for various purposes. This is the purpose of the mystics, unity with God. There is great benefit uh, from meditation to physical health, to emotional calmness, to mental order. Uh, these are all good things. But those seeking a spiritual path realize they have to go beyond these physical or uh, psychological benefits to a deeper level of consciousness. So I want to take a couple of minutes to tell you what I'm not talking about when speaking about contemplation. I'm not talking about letting your mind go into a passive state and becoming a medium. Uh, very much the opposite. Both of those states come with some consequences that we might not be that prepared for. We're in meditation or contemplation, keeping our mind in a state of calm awareness. I'm also not talking about going into a trance or being unconscious. If a person does either of those things, when they awaken, they have no memory of what happened. They have no idea what happened while they were in a trance. So that can't really help with their spiritual maturity. We're also not talking about any kind of self-hypnosis. And I'm not talking about falling asleep, although that may happen, especially if somebody tries to meditate while they're laying down. It's also not about seeking visions or having paranormal experiences. Mystics sometimes have visions but they're almost like the side effect of their spiritual work. They try not to be distracted from their primary quest, which is unity with the one. In fact, uh, some spiritual teachers believe that many visions come from evil sources meant to just to distract the mystic. So they do their best to avoid them. Let me return then to Meister Eckhart and review for just a second. We've learned that he taught a worldview that sees us as living in the divine and a spark or a light of God being within each one of us. And he, like the other mystics, promotes becoming aware of our soul as a way to understand God. Here's another great quote. Our Lord teaches how noble humanity is by nature created and how divine by grace he or she may aspire to be. The seed of God is in us. The seed of God is in us. Pear seeds grow into pear trees. Nut seeds grow into nut trees. 
God seed into God. Remember the Orthodox branch of Christianity uh, takes it for granted that divination that is becoming divine can be the result of our faith walk eventually for everybody. Mystics agree, and they all believe that the seed of divinity is within us. Here's Thomas Merton on the same topic. In the center of our being is a point of nothingness, which is untouched by sin and by illusion, a point of pure truth, a point or a spark, which belongs entirely to God. It's not at our disposal. God disposes our lives from there. Uh, It's inaccessible to the fantasies of our mind or the brutalities of our will. This little point of nothingness and absolute poverty is the pure glory of God in us. It's like a pure diamond blazing with the invisible light of heaven. It's in everybody. And if we could see it, we would see these billions of points of light coming together in the face and blaze of a sun that would make all the darkness and cruelty of life vanish completely. We also have a a teaching from St. Augustine. Augustine was one of the earliest Christian theologians, and he is actually responsible for a good deal of what the church people believe. He was teaching about spiritual development, and uh, in his example, he said that we're in a grade school, and in, and in grade six, that's the highest grade, he says in the sixth grade, a person is disformed and transformed in the divine eternal nature, having achieved full perfection. He has forgotten the things of this temporal life and has been caught up into the likeness of God. So with his words, we begin to look more closely at a new topic, a topic that has been sort of mentioned in passing in these quotes. It's the topic of the process of going from a spark of the soul into a fully mature and fully aware person. Augustine says, the person has forgotten the things of the passing temporal life. Meister Eckhart says, it's a sign of inward infirmity that any person should be sad or glad about the passing things of this world. And last week we heard in the cloud, do what you can to forget all God's creations and all their actions so that your thoughts and desires are not directed toward anything but God. So we have this perfect and holy center, but most people have no knowledge of it And even those who do can't live totally in its light. It's sort of like a mirror within us that reflects only goodness. But our life and our experiences and um, the illusional reality that we live in have covered our mirror with dirt and grime. So we no longer see the goodness in its reflection. The journey inward of contemplation is to rediscover this inner person to clean off the mirror. Another way to uh, describe our situation would be to say that your mind, your emotions, and your body are vehicles 
that were given to your spirit to express himself or herself in the world. But we, you and I, the vehicles, have taken over and done our own thing and uh, never listened to the directions of the driver. We're like a horse that's gone wild, galloping around the world, and um, all the while, our rider is trying to control the reins. But when we begin a spiritual path, then we find the ability to listen to the rider, to follow the instructions of our drive. Finally, we're headed in the right direction. Now, I spent a lot of time in these first few lessons instilling the idea that within each one of us is this spark of divinity, because that's something that the average Christian has not heard very much about in their local congregation. And the reason it is so important is because um, when the mystic reaches the understanding of oneness with God, they also recognize that this spark of divinity is within everyone, not just them, but every other person. And they begin to see that all people are one, that they are all in the way we look at other people. In fact, Thomas Merton says, if we could see the spark of God, the glory of God in other people, really, that our problem would be we would probably want to fall down and worship that person. So um, that's kind of why I've been um, really uh, pounding that concept in, because as 21st century people, we feel very separated one from the other. And it isn't getting any better because of our technology. We used to at least talk to our friends. And now um, the youngest generation that has grown up with cell phones and texting has isolated themselves even more than people in my generation and the next one following. Uh, so this idea of being separated is difficult to overcome. And in the mystic, that is one of the major things that is overcome. They become one with God and one with all other people. And that breaks down those barriers between people that we see, those uh, barriers based on uh, ethnic or cultural differences or skin color or country of origin. All of those things no longer mean anything. But the preparation for that is understanding that within ourselves. So next week, we're going to delve into the process of removing some of the layers of dirt from our mirror, seeing how we remove some of the conditioning that has been put on us by our life thus far. And we'll see why the mystics call the world an illusion. And we'll also meet another um, intriguing mystic named Pseudo Dionysius. So I hope you'll be able to uh, join with me again next week. 